Welcome to the GovComs podcast, bringing you the latest insights and innovations from experts and thought leaders around the globe in government communication. Now, here is your host, David Pembroke. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to GovComs, the podcast that examines the practice of content communication in government and the public sector. My name is David Pembroke, and thank you very much for joining me. Today, we examine the Digital News Report, Australia 2019, and we do that with one of its authors, Assistant Professor Caroline Fisher, who works at the Journalism School at the University of Canberra. Uh, In 2014, Caroline completed her PhD, which examined the career transition between journalism and parliamentary media advising. And before she got into academia, she was an academic and she worked as a producer and a reporter and a presenter for ABC News and Radio National. And interestingly, she also worked as a media advisor to the former Premier of Queensland, Anna Bly. So a diverse career, (laughs) an experienced career, and someone who I think it's great has jumped into academia. But really, one of the things I'm really interested in is I think we're into, I'm not quite sure how many years it's been going, but there's some real insights into the digital news report. But before I do any more talking, I will say good afternoon to Caroline Fisher. Hi, David. Thanks for having me. No, no problem at all. How many years is this? (laughs) This is is our fifth report. Fifth report. What's the headline? Oh, my gosh. The headline. Um, The headline is that uh, we are avoiding news more. Uh, that we're still concerned about fake news, but there are signs we are actually starting to check uh, the news that we consume. And compared to other countries in the world, we are the lightest news consumers. The lightest? The lightest. How do we define lightest? So people who consume news once a day or less are defined as lightest, and those who consume news more than once a day are uh, considered heavy. And out of the 38 countries in this global survey... Australia is number 38. And have we always been (laughs) down the bottom? Fairly close to the bottom. Yeah, we've been in that sort of lower end. Uh, But this year we are at the bottom uh, and and it'll be interesting to to track that over time. It's a really interesting thing. And I think there's a, you know, I I, I can't answer that definitively. I think there's there's a few pointers in the report which show that there are concerns about negativity of the news, about relevance of the news, uh, trust, a range of things which indicate that the news isn't hitting the mark for a lot of consumers. It could also be, uh, partly, that our attention is being called upon by so many things now yeah. that it could actually be sort of a, a diffraction of our attention, you know, that we're actually being diverted towards other things. So is it that we're not interested in the news or are we more interested in other things? And I think, okay, you know... That's just as a matter of interest. No, no, that's something we need to explore more. But just as a matter of interest, who is the, the most interested cohort or most interested country in news? Oh, I think off the top of my head, I can pull this, actually open the report to the relevant page, but I think it's Sweden. Oh, there you go. Um, in fact, I can tell you right now as she digs through. Um, here we go. Interest in Oh, heavy and light. Here we go. Yeah, it's Sweden. Sweden. So they've got 85%. Is that right? Yes. 85% of their population are considered heavy news users compared to us, 52%. Well, there you go. Yeah. Well, I suppose that... Even Mexico has but, but more that, news, heavy news consumers than we do. Yeah, well, I suppose they've got a lot more to worry about than we do <laughs> in lots of ways, don't they? And we're, th- a, we're a long way away. It's a lot from, colder. We're a long I think, way away uh, from the rest of the world. Well, yeah, I th- but look, you know... Yeah, um, environmental... Yeah, I think, about, I think well. there is a whole bunch of cultural issues in there. But in fact, you know, when I saw this, I thought, oh, it's got to, it must be to do with education because education is so important in all of the findings, actually. Mm. So I thought, okay, well, maybe we've got lower education levels than, you know, than the other countries in the survey. No, that wasn't the answer. So I think it partly has to be a cultural thing. Hmm. Okay, we'll come back to education in, in, in a moment. But yep. that, I'm interested in that point you raised about... Um, you know, are we interested or not interested? And I was yeah. reading somewhere the other day, can't quite remember where it was, but it was, I think it may have been, it was something in, in the States that was talking about surveys of 
people consuming news and people say that they would like, they want to read, you know, good news and they want to see this and they want to see that. But when they actually get it served up to them, actually, that's not what they want at all. They want the negativity. They want the headlines. They want the stuff that's uh, a bit rougher and tougher. So they're saying one thing and doing another. It's possible. Um, I think... That's a very academic answer. Well, (laughs) I think there are a couple of things there. I I do think there is a, a general acceptance that... News, it's like, you know, reading the news, it's a bit like eating your veggies. You know, it's good for you. You don't necessarily like everything that you're eating. You know, you're not wild about Brussels sprouts, but you'll eat them anyway. And I think there's an element about an acceptance that news is important, you know, for our general knowledge to participate in society, uh, but it is often negative. It's not always relevant to my life. Uh, you know, there's a whole range of things that don't tick all of our sort of satisfaction boxes, but but it's kind of important anyway. Mm. Um so I think you, you might be right there, but there is an indication here in, in the survey this year, because we do specifically ask about negativity and relevance, mm. that a lot of people, I mean, you know, we, we do find our news more negative than news consumers in other countries find their news. I mean, we're right up there with sort of the UK and they've been dealing with Brexit and a whole bunch of ugly issues, you know. Um, and relevance, again, we asked about relevance this year and, you know, we've got a high proportion of people who think the news isn't so relevant to them than in other countries. So... But again, you know, we also have lower interest. You know, there's a whole bunch of things going on here, which is that is that a bad thing or is, this, is that just the way it always is? I yeah. mean, when we then look, okay, well, what's, what's the absolute, you know, bottom line here? What's the thing that really matters? Who's paying for it? Okay, so we have 14% of Australians uh, who are paying for online news. All right, well, that's, you know, 1% above the global average of 13%. So, mm. you know... We're actually not out of whack particularly there uh, when you look at the average. Um, so maybe that's just it. Maybe there's just this kind of 14 15%. Maybe we can improve it, you know, over time if we try really hard to be more engaging or be more relevant and, and push on these other kind of uh, indicators. Uh, but there's no silver, there's no silver bullet. Mm. What about, what's the, the, the general view then if we look at Australia and we do have a big audience here that is um, not just in Australia, is elsewhere. So I'm interested in uh, sort of the global um, uh, impacts around this uh, digital news report. Mm. But how well do we, do we think the news media are performing? Okay, so we did actually ask that question for the first time this year and I'm hoping that we'll repeat it. We can't ask every question every year because it just becomes unwieldy. We, t- we tend to sort of skip a year and then ask and so we keep some kind of track but um, over time but without asking the questions every year. So, yes, we asked uh, five about five indicators of news performance and I haven't got them staring in front of me but off the top of my head they were, <clears throat> excuse me, relevance, negativity, scrutiny, um, so sort of keeping you up to date and uh, helping you understand, you know, the news. So when it came to um, keeping people up to date, we're, we're reasonably satisfied. So about two thirds of the consumers were going, "Yep, yeah, Australia, we, you're doing an okay job in keeping us up to date," mm-hmm. and that was kind of a bit higher than the global average actually. So that was good tick to us there. Um, when it came to helping us understand news events, about fifty six percent of us said. They thought the news media was doing an okay job at that. Again, slightly above the above the global average for that. When it came to scrutiny, um, off the top of my head, I think it's forty six percent of of us said that we thought the news media was doing a good job scrutinising those in power, and that was below slightly below the global average. When it came to negativity, forty four percent of us thought we, we were too negative, and that was above the global average. And when it came to helping us. I think I might have missed something there, but I think helping us understand, was it? No. What's the last one? Can't think. Um, but we were below the global average on, on most on four of the six kind of questions that we asked, or mm. three of the five. Um, so, yeah, different measures there. So uh, we weren't doing so well on, um, yeah, on the scrutinising and on the negativity. Um, oh, the relevance. That's right, relevance. So we had lower relevance as well than mm. other countries. But so... By and large, we're reasonably happy with the way the news is doing their, the media is doing their job. Uh, I don't think that's presented a very positive picture. No, I would say think that <sighs> mixed. I think it's pretty mixed, um, and it's the interesting thing is that it really varies depending on your demographic. So, older people. Mm-hmm. 
are much more satisfied. They think the, jo- the media is doing a much better job of right. holding the powerful to account on basically all of the indicators. It's the young and women are the people who are less satisfied, particularly Gen Y women, so young women, right. are the least satisfied, think the news is the least relevant, et cetera. Um, so it because really does... Because their views aren't being reflected. I, I suspect so, yeah. yeah. Um, they think that they're not, you know, that they have the... That the fact that the news media isn't holding the powerful to account. I mean, particularly amongst you know Gen Y and Gen Y women. So yeah, there's there's there. Are, so when you look at it broadly, you think, oh yeah. But when you actually break it down into those demographics, it's actually very interesting. Yeah, and and people who are so the, the most educated, the highest incomes, etc., the most engaged, the most interested in politics, the most interested in news. Those are the highest trust in news. Mm. They they tend to rank all of all of those things high, more highly. Now, you made the areas. point there around um, fact-checking and, yeah. and fake news. What, yeah. what are the findings around fact-checking and yeah. fake news? Because p- people are seriously taking the effort to actually go <laughs> and validate Not everybody, news. I can assure you. No. Certainly the majority aren't. Uh, but a, there's about a third, you know, give or take, across uh, different measures of, of verification that we asked about. Um so, yeah, overwhelmingly most people aren't, but there is this group, again, of highly engaged um, heavy news users mm-hmm. who, are, who are checking uh, news sources. So the, the sort of the most commonly um, used verification technique is to check a story against another source, you right. know, using multiple sources to, you know, and that about 36% of people said they did that. Mm-hmm. Um, then there was about... 20% of people who said that they'd decided to stop sharing a story that came from someone they didn't trust. So that's good. Mm-hmm. But 80% of people, you know, Still. haven't stopped doing that. No. Um, about 22% of people said that they'd stopped using a dodgy source and gone to a more reliable news source. That's good. So there's a range of measures where there's you can see that there is some activity happening. Uh, it's better than no activity. Uh, let's hope it grows. Mm. And what about in terms of the actual sources where people are getting their information? I was reading the Mary Meeker Internet Trends Report, which mm-hmm. comes out um, every year, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, and it made the point again about the power of Facebook mm. and it being such an enormous source of, of news and information. Did that does that yeah. tally with with, with your, what you're finding Globally, as well? we've seen a bit of a drop in the use of, of Facebook for news, and mm. that we've seen that here as well. Um, and trust in news on social media has dropped. <coughs> Sorry, but, dr- drop in growth of or yeah. drop in drop in growth? It's 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 stagnating a bit, you know. Right. And it's over, overseas, it's dropped more. <laughs> uh, in Australia, it hasn't <laughs> dropped as much. We're quite big social media users, and yeah. um, particularly Gen Y and Gen Z. I think it's about forty seven percent of them rely on it as their main source. It's how they get their news absolutely mainly. Um, so, uh, yeah, and social media consumption is still is still big. Facebook is still the hundred pound gorilla Mm. (laughs) in that field, Uh, particularly among women. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting actually when you look at social media and the different platforms. So men will um, uh, just will use online sources more um, and and Twitter when it comes to an actual social uh, media site, uh, whereas women absolutely on Instagram, absolutely on Facebook. And what about the, you know, the more traditional um, sources of news, you know, your radio news, your television news, your print news, or yeah. even the online channels of the of the uh, uh, the traditional mastheads? How are they performing? Well, gen- I mean, across the generations, it's, there's, the generational divide is absolutely there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, particularly uh, TV and newspapers um, amongst the older cohorts, you know, and we're looking now particularly amongst 73 plus. So it's interesting seeing the shift across generations. Um, uh yeah, um, so they're still in play, absolutely. TV is still the main source of news in Australia. So mm-hmm. that's, that's. I mean, it's declining, but yeah. it's still it's still there, particularly in regional Australia, mm-hmm. very much uh, stronger there. I mean, TV absolutely rules. It partly reflects the older demographic as well um, and education and a range of other demographic um, sort of reasons. Uh, yeah, but t- TV is absolutely there. S- social media is growing uh, very strongly. YouTube's... You know, really, I mean, social, Facebook has dropped off a bit and YouTube's kind of hmm. 
rising right. fast. Mm. And you mentioned there around um, paying for news. Yeah. Obviously, the big change in the last few years is about uh, really the destruction of the business models that used to support uh, news. How are we going in terms of that revenue being replaced by people actually ponying up money? Yeah. I mean, look, it's a really interesting question. Um, I Historically, I need to actually probably go back and look at this. What percentage of the population actually bought a newspaper, you know, mm. 20 years ago? I guess that's the only, you know, or 30 years ago. I guess that's the best measure, really, because it was the only form of news you had to pay for. Mm. You know, yeah. everything else was free. Yeah. Um, so... You know, 14%. But I know from my own habits, and perhaps I'm a bit of a news junkie, but I pay for New York Times, Washington Post, Economist, uh, the Australian, the Financial Review, the Canberra Times. Like, I pay for heaps of them. Yeah, well, you are. And is it, am, am I odd? Absolutely odd. I'm odd. Yeah, okay. Yeah, completely odd. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. Uh- but I do. <laughs> But I just, no, but, but this I is love your it. business. But I love it. Yes, I, I love know. it. Yeah, I of course. It. You're, you're highly engaged, yeah. um, highly interested in news. Yeah. You know, you've you know, you've had tertiary education. I mean you tick all of these boxes yeah. that uh, you know, but you are a minority, an absolute mm. minority. Mm. There are fewer people in your category of news consumption interested in engagement. Yeah. Uh, then you know more people were excluded from the survey because they did they consumed news less than once a month <laughs> than belong in your category. God strike. So <laughs> anyway, let's. Let, let, I think the big issue around these sorts of surveys is really the important question of so what. Yeah, what yeah. does this mean? Now this particular podcast is for people working yeah. in government and the public sector who are trying to tell the story of of the policy that they're working on or the, the program or the regulation or the service or whatever it, is, mm. it, it, it may be. What does it mean for them? Well, the whole ethos behind this survey, and I guess just to, you know, sort of reiterate for people who aren't really familiar with it. So our report is part of this global survey, which is coordinated by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford. And there are 38 countries involved in it. And the whole point of it, uh, and, you know, the genesis of this global study is to provide an evidence base Mm. for people in government and in industry, you know, through these turbulent times, to help guide decision making, and um, and we are you know developing now this longitudinal evidence base, and and we can compare ourselves now uh, to the rest of the world, and that's what's unique about the survey, and I think is really useful about the survey. So we're just not looking at, at ourselves in isolation, um, because you know it, it, there is no local media anymore. <laughs> you know it is a global uh, yeah. it is a global uh, f- you know marketplace. So that's that's the point of it, and I think if there is you know that is why we do it. Mm-hmm. That's the motivation behind it, and and I but think. What does it actually, mean for me in my daily work? What, how is it going to change? What decisions am I making now that are perhaps influenced by this? That might have been different to what I was decisions I was making twelve months ago. What what should I stop doing, and what should I start doing as a result of the information in this report? I would be thinking. I think for you as a government communicator, I think it's really about how how you sell the message and really, I mean, I think really understanding these generational differences, you know, I mean, absolutely do not disconnect from your older consumers, okay. you know, I mean, all the platforms are still there, you know, you know, the newspaper, you know, um, video didn't kill the radio star, you know, it's mm-hmm. all happening, everyone's still, all the platforms are alive and it's just completely hybrid. Um, so maintaining that, really understanding the differences. I think um, really so understanding the differences before, between regional television. The differences between the regions is very important. The st- difference between important. the genders, the difference between generations, and yeah. and I think for me actually, and I think partly the the election has also shone a light, a light on this. I this think is the, the Australian election. Yep. Um, so the the really big. Uh, issue I think that comes glaringly out at this for me and, and is my take out as a researcher um, is about the disengaged. Right. And and particularly when you come to look at uh, those with lower education and income levels, uh, the you know, the, the the low levels of information consumption and, you know, we're the, the few sources, the few brands that they use, etc., um, the lack of, you know, the, the low frequency of their news consumption. 
And um, I think that that is a real issue, the fact that these people also are the least likely to fact check. You know, there's a whole bunch of things uh, that are bound up with low education. Uh, and when we, we, in response to the election result, we actually, we, we'd almost put the report to bed, quite literally. We were proofing it to send to the printer. And, uh, and the election results, you know, took everyone by surprise. And I just said, my God, we've got to dig into this further. What happened? Where are these people getting, you know, who are all these undecided voters and, you know, given the amount of fake news and all the rest of it, what's going on here? And so we ended up doing this additional chapter on political orientation and news consumption to try and find out a bit more about what's going on here. And so we found this, you know, we asked people every year, you know, what, how do you identify on the spectrum, you know, left to right wing, um, centre, or don't know. There's a significant proportion of Australians who don't know, uh, well, they don't identify in any way with, um, with the political orientation. These people have the lowest news consumption, the lowest interest in news, the lowest interest in politics. They are the least likely to fact check, low education levels. These are a vulnerable, you know, part of the population. Mm. And for me, I think that's the total takeout. I think it's the real policy problem, and I think it's a, I think it's an audience that is really um, it's disengaged for a whole range of reasons. Um, but I think we really need to examine this group of people and and try and activate it in some way. But but they're not engaged in news, but they are engaged in content of some form. Of some form, and because, that we need to understand that much more. You know, the so household what, penetration rates of mobile devices. Absolutely. Everybody has them. That's right. But so they're not necessarily interested in... in, in, in news or politics. ...fact-based information that, or, that is coming out of mainstream brands. Yeah, they may well be getting absolutely from elsewhere and when we ask around, you know, we can't ask about every single brand, you know, traditional or non, in the survey. It's just not big enough. There's so many out there now. Uh, there's always a significant cohort of people who tick the other box, mm. you know, and we need to know much more about, well, what's other? Mm. You know, what's that? What's that? Uh, and I think that's, you know, for me, as someone who's trying to understand the role of the news media and just, you know, information and the fractured information environment in democracy, mm. that's, they're the people that I think we need to focus on. Interesting. So that would then suggest perhaps innovation and change and not relying on the traditional channels, but really starting to explore third party influences, mm -hmm. maybe celebrity, maybe through maybe. sports, maybe yep. through other ways of being able to wrap that worthy message that yep. you're trying to communicate yep. uh, in some sort of other <laughs> wrapper, yeah. I suppose, yeah, right. in, in, in a way of getting it explained in such a way that people would understand it. Well, I think that's right. I mean, I think, you know, and I, I guess that's the genesis of, of, of um, you know, the project on Channel 10, for instance. I mean, they, that's a pretty good, they do a pretty good job of yeah. dressing news up, you know, wrapping it in comedy. Yes. You know, tying yeah. a comedy bow around it, you know, yeah. and, and doing something else with it. Mm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and uh, I think that that's, um, the, those types of novel approaches, I think, I think we need a lot more of them. So would you say it's more complex and it's harder? <laughs> to, to, to tell a story or to get a message across. You know, you, you mentioned this notion of attention, you know, yeah, the yeah. attention economy. Yeah. How is it that we can find or earn a share of That's right. a person's most valuable asset, which is their time yeah. and their attention? So for, for the government communicator, you're going to have to work harder. Is that the message? <laughs> um, yes, I, I, look, have to try. You're gonna have to test and learn, and it sounds like you're gonna have to experiment and really quite adapt, quite an agile mindset of, uh, you know, te you know, or coming, gathering evidence, creating a hypothesis, testing the hypothesis. Maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't. Take what you can from it. Try it again. More research. More evidence. More understanding. Try something else and really try it in all sorts of different ways. I think sort of, you know, thinking that you're going to put something in place and it's going to be a set and forget, um, not going to work, is it? No, it's not going to for, uh, No, it's not going to work. And I think that, you know, people are in their, you know, they're so able to curate their information lives now. And so if you're only interested in sport and that's all you want, well, then you'll just adjust your feed accordingly. Yeah. So then, yeah, how is it then you, you reach those people? You know, yeah, what is the sport angle <laughs> on the story? Yeah. To get to those people. Yeah. Well, what is, the, what is the parenting angle on the story to get to the other people? Or, you know, I mean, I think that's right. I think people, um, people are extremely busy 
and there are so many demands on their attention. Um, and we do prefer, you know, we do want to relax and we do want entertainment. I mean, mm. that's the other thing you're asking about paying. So we gave people a choice in the survey this year and said, okay, you know, you've got you've got one you, you've got eight choices to subscribe. You know, whether online gaming, online dating, you know. Uh, video streaming services, um, music video, uh, music streaming services, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, online news. Um, you've got one choice. What, what are you going to choose? And of course, everyone chose. Well, not everyone, but you know, the majority chose video streaming services. You know, and I guess we we were saying yeah, they've chosen Netflix over news just uh, for the alliteration. But you know, <laughs> it could have been Amazon over news. Yeah. Um, but yeah, video is number one. You know, number two, we then gave them the second choice. It was music streaming services. You know, news came in all the time. Now that's not the case in other countries, but certainly in Australia. Hmm. Um, yeah. So I mean, thirty four percent chose as for their first choice uh, video streaming services 9% chose news did you ask or explore any any of this sort of again aver- emerging trend of personalization of of information being directed towards a particular person's interest you know the use of automation the use of artificial intelligence we the did, gathering of okay. data that sort yeah, of thing no uh, th- so the one ai type question we asked was to do with actually um looking at devices so looking at um you know um you know mobile no 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 the little smart oh, you, phone you know the smart alexa alexa <laughs> Right. Sorry, Google Home or Google whatever. Home, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, we were looking at that, and that so you know we're early adopters. You know the take up for general usage is quite high, in, um, mm. and it's growing quickly. Uh, but the use of those devices it's for twice. news is very low. Yeah, very low. It's like three percent. Yeah, but here in Australia, I, I think we're still miles behind. Like yeah, no, that's true. Really gone hard on that in the states and in in uh, Europe mm. as well. There. Yeah. You know, that's going to be a big. I think that's going to be a massive trend. Is how do yeah. we create content to get into those home, yeah. home-based devices? No, it's interesting about the AI though. Um, I actually pitched that as a possible question for this year's survey, and people thought that it wasn't sort of maybe too early to ask the question. Yeah. But I, I think, think people understand artificial. I don't understand artificial. No, but I, I, if you, you know, but there are. I mean, but you know, when it comes to journalism, there are surveys that you know and, and studies that have been done to kind of test people's. Um, the quality perception yeah. of a story that's been written by a computer uh, and and or by a person. And um, o- often <laughs> the one written by the computer um, is seen to be, yeah. you know, more objective, more reliable, yeah. et cetera. So it's inter- I mean, not always. I mean, there are different surveys, different results. But, mm. you know, it's hard. sometimes it's hard to tell and sometimes it's seen as more reliable. But mm. I think that they're certainly, as we increasingly use AI for journalism, these are questions for the future for our survey. Okay, so the, the, the summary and take-out <laughs> message for the good... Good people who are working in government communicators, <laughs> uh, government communications is um, there's no rest. No there's rest. No, there's no, no, no rest. There's you, no rest. You are you're going to have to redouble your efforts. You're going to have to work harder. You're going to have to try to find those insights in the data. You have to try to find a little bit more information about those audiences because this increasing uh, segmentation, um, fragmentation. Uh, personalization it's going to mean that people are going to, are getting harder and harder and harder to reach so that's right i think, and I, I, think, think this, I think this is where offline comes into it as well i think that you know there is this preponderance and you know the ease of being able to you know whip something up and get it out online and think jobs done you know i think creating that environment where you can perhaps get in front of people get in front of influencers create a you know a human you know interaction i think increasingly i know it's not a scale game but i think it could be increasingly important uh because again you know policy i think is getting narrower as it seeks to try to solve the problems of specific groups in yeah. in society as well so yeah i think it's it's a fascinating time it, but just um, don't forget television i mean it is still the winner mm. the endurance of television really it's 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 <laughs> It's an extraordinary story. It is. The power of TV. I mean, it just people, I think people are tired. They just want to relax. They sit down and they just, you know, they want to uh, and they sit in front of the box. And we do. Yeah, but they sit in front of the box and they've got another thing in their hand. Called sometimes. The, you know. Sometimes. Not do. a lot? Not always? Well, I don't know. I mean, there, there are dual screening, you know, plenty of dual screening um, surveys out there. It mm. depends on your demographic. Yeah. Yeah, but often people will be there. It's like Gogglebox. Yeah. They'll be, <laughs> they might be texting their friend about what they're watching on TV. Hmm. 
Interesting times. <laughs> Assistant Professor Caroline Fisher, thank you very much. Oh. Where can people find out more and, and get, get to the yeah. link and be able to sort of dive into it in the um, – Three and a half minutes spare that they may That's have. A great cure for insomnia. <laughs> if you have any trouble, no, I shouldn't say that. It took us months to write. Uh, no, no. You can find it uh, via the website for our uh, research centre, which is the News and Media Research Centre at the University of Canberra. So if you put that in, uh, it'll come straight up there. And so that's the Australian version. And for yep. our good friends overseas, where yep. might they Reuters. find out? Yeah. Where where their country's particular um, survey has been done. Yeah, so you can just uh, look for, go to the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism uh, and it'll be there or just simply look up Digital News Report 2019 um, and that will give you the global version. Whereas if you want the Australia version, you need Digital News Report Australia 2019. Very good. Okay. Assistant Professor Caroline Fisher from the School of Journalism at the University of Canberra, thank you very much for coming in today. And to you, the audience, thank you for coming back once again. Uh, interesting times. Yeah, as I say... Just get back to work. Have a, have a good lie down and get back to work tomorrow and keep working hard, keep trying to find those insights, testing, learning, evaluating, measuring, trying something else. But I think that was a great insight, that last one about TV. That was maybe something that I've started to forget a little bit, um, that if you can make it work on television, why not? Because uh, certainly it obviously works very uh, powerfully, and it's not just in the cities. I think that was the other insight out of the um, the interview with uh, Assistant Professor uh, Fisher there, where she's talking about the power of television in regional communities as well. Very, very powerful there. So there you go, another great episode of GovCom. So thank you very much for coming along today. But for the moment, it's bye for now. You've been listening to the GovCom's podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate and subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes.